and our closing address will be given by Roar Bionis. Roar Bionis is the co-founder of Systems Change Alliance, a longtime environmental activist and a writer on ecology and alternative economics, which he terms eco-economics. He was the editor of the American Common Future magazine in the mid 90s, a magazine which featured some of the first articles taking a critical look at the so-called sustainable development model. He is the author of the book, Growing a New Economy, which outlines the macroeconomic framework for an eco-economy that in which world-renowned environmentalist Bill McKibben calls a hopeful account of the possibilities contained in our current crises. Roar, take it away. All right, thank you, Lydia. And I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> All right. So um, this has been an amazing day, uh, been an amazing diversity of speakers, thought-provoking, inspiring, and informative. Um, the theme of the day has been beyond the Great Reset as a takeoff uh, from the World Economic Forum's The Great Reset. And we had so many amazing uh, speakers today. And here is the, a list of all of them. And I just wanted to share a few words about uh, what they talked about. Because, as I said, it's been diverse and thought-provoking and also extremely informative. Starting with uh, Helena norberg Hodge, uh, who I have been following for many, many years. Uh, I met her actually when I was living in Oregon many years ago, and she gave a talk there. Um, and that was um, maybe just you know a decade and a few more years after she came back from Ladakh, where she developed this understanding of the importance of uh, localization and the local economy. And um, one of the key point in her talk was, of course, the importance of localization and learning from indigenous cultures, but also she was emphasizing the importance of understanding how global capitalism works and how its policies, how its global policies impacts and destroys local cultures, and the importance of understanding how global trade works so that we can develop alternative policies. And of course, another thing that she emphasized was that economic growth is just an artificial byproduct of capitalism's profit making. And that's why we have ended up with the kind of um, impoverished local cultures that we have today. And, and, and Priscilla's uh, talk about her own experience on the reservation is an effect of that going back you know, hundreds of years. So, our next speaker after Helena was uh, another friend of mine, uh, Sohaili Naitola, who uh, <laughs> opened up, interestingly enough, by saying that the Stone Age did not end due to lack of stones, and that the fossil fuel age will not end due to lack of fossil fuel. In other words, these time changes that is happening are ending because of ideas but at the same time, not because we don't have the tools, but because we don't have the imagination. And sometimes, unfortunately, our imagination is very destructive. And so he was going through four possible future scenarios uh, of what can happen, which is we could have no change. We could keep on going like we are and, and destroying the planet in uh, its wake. We can have marginal change, which we have in so many ways, uh, in some places, you know, uh, uh, Emily Cavano was just talking about uh, the New Deal and, and the Green New Deal and so on. And these are marginally 
marginal changes or adaptive changes. In other words, we tax the rich a little bit and, and we adopt um, some uh, environmental policies here and there, we recycle and so on. However, Sohel was emphasizing that we need to be even more imaginative than that. We need at some point radical change where humans, nature, technology, and the human spirit come together and create change and create a Gaian civilization based from the indigenous cultures, from the local cultures towards the global culture. And this part is kind of the sticking point, I think, in the future, because so many people are seeing the destruction of the global polity or the global policies that we have made, and, and they're so afraid of any kind of global governance. But at the same time, Sohel is emphasizing the need to have both um, local policies that are strong, regional, bioregional, and that needs to be supported by global policies that are truly sustainable. And of course, Byron Joel talked about this at the great uh, length and likened this idea of a great reset um, as uh, the elite or the capitalists are talking about today as what happened during the industrial revolution, which was a complete replacement. All the people from the countryside in the Western world and it created a lot of poverty and so on. And that is what we're seeing today. This idea that if we just do this and if um, uh, Bill Gates is able to just tweak the economy a little bit with his ideas, then everything will be fine. But it is not that simple. And at, as a matter of fact, that can create massive uh, negative change. And then we had uh, Claire Politano, um, who emphasized the importance of taking back our commons, meaning not just the land, not just the water, not just the local energy sources, but also the intellectual commons, the internet, take it away, create co-ops, make it non-commercial and so on. This is such an important point because we know how important, how powerful Facebook and, and Google is in our life and has become sort of the global brain that is controlling us in so many ways. So again, a very powerful talk. Daniel Christian Wall talks about system change, that it is not a straight line, not from A to Z, not just, you know, we decide to go from here to there, we see some problems over there but rather we need to think in terms of adaptive change. And we need to be ready also for sometimes revolutionary change, that sometimes we adapt, sometimes we, we make certain reforms, but other times we change with leaps and bounds. And that I think is also an important insight to have. And then he said something interesting that we're all indigenous to life and to nature. And we need to activate new, a new system story, not just being against something and then from that sort of anti-sentiment, create a new story, but create a new story based on something positive, something deep and systemically regenerative. Richard Heinberg gave us a, quite a stark wake up call when it comes to energy and basically saying that only 20% of the energy that uh, we're using today comes from electricity and the other 80% comes from fossil fuels, directly from fossil fuels in agriculture, in industry and so on. And that is um, the biggest challenge. In other words, he said that the main challenge is the, this, uh, that the hurdle of scale that in order to change sort of the global um, systems in terms of energy, the scale is, is a hurdle and also how to store the energy. And then of course, he said that some of the alternatives um, here is in terms of 
localizing as so many of the speakers talk about we need to localize the economy we need to localize the energy grid and then um caroline hergris Her my co-author uh in my book uh, growing a new economy came up with this idea that he really liked that we need elegant energy systems which i i think is a, is a wonderful concept then of course um after that this afternoon James Culligan, another uh, good friend, and whom I've been working with uh, in uh, economic democracy uh, movement in recent years in EDA, um, <clears throat> talked about distributed economy because, as he said, we need a new kind of kind of economic system in order to meet human needs, not to meet human greed or or the capitalist supply and demand system. We need to supply need, <clears throat> not demand. And we need to tie the economy to the carrying capacity. And what is that? That is the potential resources in nature that is available and compared to the needs of the population, the local population. And then he said we need to move from value added to value renewed because we need to have a circular economy in, in that sense. We need to take care of making sure that we're not just extracting value from nature, but we also need to renew um, that back into the system, back into the ecology. And then Emily Cavano talked about the solidarity economy, which I think is an incredibly important uh, movement, a progressive movement. And she started out by saying something that I think is very important. We need to understand what capitalism is especially corporate capitalism, um, which is in many ways, so many ways, controlling the economy right now, controlling the planet. We need to be clear about what it is and what it is not. We need to build transformative re reforms and we need to have a solidarity economy that embraces a post-capitalist future. And then last but not least, um, Priscilla Kinney brought us back to her indigenous homes yeah, in the climate area where she's now living. And I actually, I, I lived not too far away from that in Ashland, Oregon for uh, for over a decade. So I'm familiar with that, that area. And I know the devastation that has happened to, uh, to the salmon in that area. But she is hopeful and is also putting forward a very positive um, idea about the future we can have which is based in this indigenous stewardship and community indigenous community we need to be in alignment with nature we need clean air we need uh, um, healthy food and so on and land and then what struck me was what you said that five percent of the population of the world are indigenous <clears throat> people but these indigenous people are controlling a vast amount of the biodiversity. And that is why indigenous people are so important and hold a key to the future of the world's biodiversity. So I just wanted to share that overview because if uh, someone is watching this, uh, you know, at some point in the future, they may then go into all of the different talks that we've had today, which have been just amazing and really blown me away, every speaker. So uh, with that said, I just wanted to briefly go through some of the ideas behind System Change Alliance and why we think system change is so important. So, and, and why we need to look at some of the problems uh, sort of squarely in the face. So a brief history of the world's biggest footprint you know we all we all talk about ecological footprint the carbon footprint actually the carbon foot, footprint is sort of a spin-off from the idea of an ecological footprint that william reese talked about in 1992 and then bp started promoting the carbon footprint and then from that idea they started saying you know you when you use water when you drive your car your carbon footprint is X, Y, and Z. And then they basically said, it's really not our problem. It's your problem. You, the consumer, 
need to change because we have come up with this very intelligent, smart way of looking at how you are polluting and how you're using resources and so on and so forth. It's a very, very smart marketing strategy and a way to keep car, uh, the corporate capitalist system working. So whose carbon footprint, whose systems change are we really talking about here? Our whole civilization, modern civilization, has been created by cheap fossil fuels and an economic system based on maximum profit and material growth. That's why we are in the situation we're in. So we cannot expect the same system that caused global warming to save us from global warming. That's not the way to think about it. And here's a great quote from Emma Patti in Yes Magazine, a very uh, wonderful, uh, positive magazine with, with great messaging. She says, the reality is that the future of civilization is being decided at the political and corporate level that no individual can impact. In other words, changing the light bulb will have a small impact, but it's not going to be enough to change the larger systems because this is what the corporate system is telling us. Just do small changes, just bring your cloth bag instead of your plastic bag to the supermarket and everything will be fine. Well, it is not that simple. So we need to move from global warming to global system change. Global warming is a symptom of a systemic economic and environmental failure breakdown, which has caused global unsustainability which is a symptom of a failed worldview and a failed system. And this whole conference, this summit has been about that. What is that system? How can we change it? The biggest polluters have also the most simplistic solutions. The 100 biggest corporations create 71% of world's carbon emissions. In other words, it's not just you and me. You know, I was reading a book uh, about this that, you know, we are creating more and more and then at the end of that book, I mean, all of the statistics in the book were incredible, but then the solution was, well, it's up to you guys, you as individuals. Well, it's not that simple. The corporate solution is that we have con con consumer choices and we need to change our lifestyle. That's what they're telling us. But if you think deeper about these issues, we know that the deeper solution is an integrated system change. And this is what this summit has been all about because the corporate network controlling the world is very, very dense. As a matter of fact, if you look at this ball of all these dots, these are the corporations that are controlling the world economy. And basically about 147 companies control 40% of the global capitalists. This is the corporate network that controls the planet in, in a sense. Jason Hickel, another political economist, uh, says under capitalism, private property not, is not about the right to have your own home and belongings. It's about the right of elites to enclose an appropriate commons, forests, subsurface minerals, water, the atmosphere, public goods, even knowledge itself. And this, of course, is what Claire talked about, that we need to take back our knowledge sphere, take back the commons in the intellectual sphere for you, so we don't have to be slaves of the commercial uh, industry of corporate capitalism. The sustainable solution is often presented as the way forward. We know that the Green New Deal and many of the environmentalists today, and especially in the United States, are looking towards Scandinavia as the way to go forward. And when we look at, um, you know, uh, every year when they come out with these um, new um, uh, sort of uh, statistics, they're saying that the, the Scandinavian countries are the most sustainable and so on. Yes, there are many, many positive things about the mixed economy of, of, of the, the place where I came from, from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and so on, where 30 to 40% are, are employed in the government where you have a mixed economy, more balanced than, for example, the capitalism in the United States. It is more sustainable in many ways. However, 
high consumption rate, high rate of waste, high carbon footprint, and high dependency on imports. So it is not at all a sustainable system. Here we can see that Norway is one of the Europe, Europe's most dependent on food imports. Um, Belgium, Netherlands are at the level of Haiti and Somalia in, when it comes to importing. So in terms of energy, Richard Heinberg reminded us we have a planet without a plan. We need a plan and we need a plan on so many different levels. In terms of water, we are privatizing water. The, the big uh, corporate com corporations like Nestle and so on is basically putting water in plastic bottles and selling it to the poor, such as in Lagos in, in Africa, the, the, the most densely populated city in Africa, where 19 million people are without access to clean water. So they're getting it in, now in plastic bottles from Nestle. This is not the solution. Our oceans and the forests are in peril, and we all know this, and we need to do something about it. So we have lack of policies and enforcement pro to protect the commons, and this is what is needed on, on a global international level, not the kind of free trade agreements that Helena was talking about. We need to change these free trade, trade agreements. So, um, So another problem that we have is that the rich are getting richer. The economic inequality in the world is becoming more and more pronounced, of course. And this is, in many ways, the elephant in the global living room that nobody really wants to look at, except for uh, people that are interested in real systems change. So how can we? create system change? Well, I think, first of all, we need a new kind of consciousness. We need to blend the scientific revolution with the more humanistic uh, ideas, with ethics, with culture, with deep culture. We need a new global wisdom culture beyond any specific religion, but blending the great wisdom traditions of the Western, Eastern, and the indigenous peoples. We need a new enlightenment of East, West, North, and South, a blend of indigenous Eastern wisdom and ecological science. Number two, we need government policies for people, animals, and plant. We need to move from corporate to cooperative ownership on businesses. We need, you know, as, as Sohail and, and Claire talked about, we need to turn Uber and Airbnb into uh, being owned by the, by the workers. We need small scale regenerative and cooperative economies, and we need economic democracy. Number three, we need structural change in the economic systems. The next Scandinavian model, if, if we can create that, would be state, good policies from the state, taking care of the commons, making them free for people, and then co a cooperate, the corporate sector turning into co-ops and small local businesses that would operate on a small local bio-regional scale we need to decentralize the economy. We need economic democracy and political democracy. We need limits on accumulation of wealth, and we need a deep ecological ethics. In other words, ecology, society, economy, not the other way around. Ecology need to inform society, and society need to inform the economy, because economic is not a science. It's more of a moral philosophy as Richard Heinberg was talking about. We need to have good ethics. Four, we need environmental systems change. Ecology and neo-humanism, the idea that humans, plants, animals, rocks are all part of the same Gaian system. And five, we need a global policy supporting local cultures and economies. In other words, yes, we can say farmer's market, fantastic. Yes, we can say support local economies, create uh, uh, eco-villages and so on and so forth. But unless we have global policies, national policies, regional policies supporting that, we will not have lasting system change. We need local, regional, national, international and global policies. And finally, 
system change, the system change revolution or evolution is regenerative eco-economics, moving from a linear economy to a circular economy to a regenerative life-centered economy for everyone. So this is um, my little soapbox uh, talk here from Systems Change Alliance today. And I wanna thank everyone that has been part of this uh, summit today, all the speakers that have been just incredible. And for those of you who, are, um, who haven't seen all the talks, please go and see all the talks and they will be available um, online, on Facebook, on YouTube and so on. So thank you so much for all of us. And I want to thank all my coworker, Carolina, uh, Roshni, Tiago, uh, Lydia, um, Carolina from Norway, uh, Satya Tanner from Denmark, and all of you who have uh, been working with us today. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It's been an amazing experience. Thank you. Thank you, Vor. We have reached the end of the Systems Change Summit beyond the Great Reset. Thank you again to all of our participants and our amazing speakers. If you want to learn more about Systems Change or donate to Systems Change Alliance, please visit us at systemschangealliance.org. This concludes our program today. Thank you all for joining us.